Hello, and welcome to today's lecture on Achilles. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we are going to talk about the greatest hero of the Trojan War. But just because he's the strongest and fastest and deadliest doesn't mean Achilles isn't without his flaws. Now, you probably know his flaw, of course, as his Achilles heel, but it's arguably his uncontrollable rage that leads to the death and destruction not only of his best friend, but also the slaughter of thousands. So, don't just sit there moping because Agamemnon stole your woman. Journey with me as we investigate Achilles, tragic hero of the Trojan War. You may recall the event that started the Trojan War was the Judgment of Paris, which in turn was the result of the goddess of discord Ares not being invited to a wedding, but sending along a golden apple as a gift anyway. That wedding was between Peleus, king of the Myrmidons, and Thetis, a minor sea goddess. And while the fallout from that wedding led to a ten-year-long war between the Achaeans, the word Homer uses for the Greeks, and the Trojans, who were also likely Greek in some ways, it also led to the birth of one of the greatest Greek heroes ever recorded. Now remember that Achilles' mom, Thetis, is a minor divinity, so she's immortal. And of course she wants to make her son immortal too. And she does this by taking him to the river Styx and dipping him in the water, holding him by the back of his foot. And so 99% of his body is immune to physical damage. But there's that 1%, his Achilles heel, that's still vulnerable. One of the interesting things here is that the whole Achilles heel story, and the fact that he was otherwise invincible, seems to be a much later addition. We first know about it from the Roman author Statius in the first century CE, while earlier authors, like Homer himself, seem to indicate that Achilles could, indeed, be wounded. Regardless, we do know that his mom, Thetis, had always feared for him, ever since receiving a prophecy that her son will either gain glory and die young, or live a boring life and grow old. So she sent him away to Mount Pelion to be raised and educated by the centaur Chiron, and then live peacefully out in the idyllic rural landscape. So this common theme and dilemma of gaining glory but dying young or living an old, kind of boring life, uh, is a very common trope in Greek literature. And this makes sense when you think about it, because so much of their lives revolved around warfare. It was a decision they had to make on an annual basis. It is impossible to talk about Achilles without discussing the Trojan War. The war, of course, is the result of Paris's abduction of Helen and the Achaeans' expedition to get her back. But this was no easy task. The war lasts a full ten years, and our best source for the conflict, Homer's Iliad, picks up with the final year of the battle. And so the Achaeans set sail for Troy. But what you have to remember here, this isn't one cohesive group, right? One single whole. Instead, this is a lot of independent little city-states. And while they're teaming up against the Trojans, they kind of each have their, uh, their own beef with each other. And those tensions are going to become apparent as the war drags on. Achilles spent much of this time laying waste to Trojan towns in the surrounding area. And the riches from his most recent conquest include two beautiful women, Chryseis and Briseis. The former he gave to Agamemnon, king of the Mycenaeans. The latter he kept for himself. Now, the problem we get here is that Chryseis, the woman who was the prize of Agamemnon, is actually a priestess of Apollo. And so Agamemnon's going to have to give her back in order not to occur the wrath of the gods. And so when he does, he takes Achilles' woman, Briseis, uh, as his new prize, putting Achilles in an awfully bad mood. With this perceived slight, we get the first sense of Achilles' famous rage. 
he storms off and takes his troops with him, vowing to fight no more, and hoping that a Trojan resurgence will show just how important he is to the Achaean alliance. And so it's here that we get our first glimpse of Achilles' famous rage. And this isn't in battle at all. Instead, this is because of a perceived slight from another one of the Achaean leaders. With Achilles' absence, the Achaeans are in trouble. The Trojans push them back from the walls, eventually getting close enough to burn some of the Greek ships. Achilles is unmoved, but his men are starting to get anxious. In particular, his best friend and possible lover, Patroclus, is eager to help the Achaean cause. And so Patroclus, best friend of Achilles, begs Achilles for his armor. He's tired of seeing all these Greeks dying and he wants to make a difference in the battle. Achilles eventually relents and Patroclus goes out onto the battlefield in Achilles' own shining armor, and the Trojans are absolutely terrified. And Patroclus is incredibly successful at the beginning, even killing Sarpedon, the son of Zeus himself. But Patroclus' victories were not to last. Eventually, he's struck by a spear, guided in part by Apollo himself, and the Trojan hero Hector delivers the fatal blow. And now the rage of Achilles begins anew, and this time it's taken to a level never before seen in all the ages of combat. Hephaestus himself crafts new armor for Achilles, and he takes to the battlefield, cutting down countless Trojans. His internal rage manifesting as external bloodlust. Troy's greatest heroes are no match for the mighty Myrmidon and the Trojan royal family knows something must be done to prevent complete slaughter. Hector, slayer of Patroclus, eventually meets Achilles in one-on-one -on -one combat. And after an intense battle between Hector and Achilles, Achilles finally gets the upper hand, slaying mighty Hector. But it doesn't end there. Achilles, instead of doing what's noble and proper and having respect for the dead, takes the body of Hector attaches it to the back of his chariot and drags it around the city three times. Any sense of noble warfare is gone. And even with vengeance, the rage of Achilles continues on. Some of Achilles' greatest battles are set during the Trojan War, but included in texts written well after the composition of the Iliad. From these later tales, we get the story of Penthesilea, daughter of Ares, the god of war, and queen of the Amazons. She's made her way to Troy in the hopes of killing the raging Achilles. Now, at first, Penthesilea is so beautiful that Achilles can't even bring himself to fight her. And it's only when she's about to kill him that Achilles' classic rage kicks into gear. And so the battle goes on, and eventually Achilles gets the upper hand and he's ready to strike the death blow. But as this is happening, right at that moment, he looks into Penthesilea's eyes and he falls in love with her at the exact same moment he's killing her. Another story recounts Achilles' battle with Memnon, the hero born of the goddess of dawn. Memnon has recently killed Achilles' second best friend. This is after Patroclus is already dead and Achilles is raging once again. Note to self, do not become Achilles' best friend, it will end poorly for you. Anyway, after an epic battle between the semi-divine Achilles and the semi-divine Memnon, Achilles eventually slays his enemy, taking vengeance for the death of his friend. Now, the dawn goddess Eos is so sad that she starts refusing to do her job. Now there is no dawn, there is no day, there is no night. And eventually Zeus has to step in and convince Eos to start doing her job once again. And one of the important things for us to remember here is that even though our kind of most complete story of the Trojan War comes from the Iliad, there are lots of other authors and stories that contribute to our knowledge and understanding of how the Greeks perceived this war to go. Like most Greek myths, the legend surrounding the death of Achilles takes many forms. The most popular, of course, revolves around his heel, the infamous weak point left when his mother, 
holding him by the heel, dipped him in the river Styx. Long after the Iliad comes to a close, the war between the Achaeans and the Trojans rages on, and eventually Achilles meets his fate with an arrow, shot by the bow of the Trojan prince Paris and guided by the mighty god Apollo, straight to the heel, his only weakness. Now, Achilles' heel is still used to describe uh, the one weakness of a usually strong person. And so Achilles eventually dies. And later, it's Odysseus, the man of many wiles, uh, who devises the Trojan horse, gets that into the city of Troy, the Greeks pour out and destroy and burn the city from the inside. What happens to Achilles after his death is debated in the ancient sources. Some say he went to the White Island of the Blessed, while others indicate he was in Hades with everyone else. Odysseus actually visits him down there in the Odyssey, and thus we hear Achilles claim that, well, quote unquote, he would rather be a slave in the living world than the king of the dead. And yet he is comforted by the heroic exploits of his son, Neoptolemus. So we get some insight into the Greek conception of the afterlife. Now, worship of the dead Achilles definitely happens, and funerary monuments to him arise all over the Greek world. One especially prominent one arises in northwestern Turkey, near the site of Troy itself. And some historical figures actually go there to visit. Alexander the Great, at the beginning of his journey and conquest of the Persian Empire, stops at this site uh, and actually has a race with his best friend, Hephaestion, around the tomb of Achilles. Just kind of Achilles, just like Achilles and Patroclus would have done back in the day. And eventually he dons the armor of Achilles himself. And so Alexander the Great is very much refashioning himself as a new Achilles as he goes on to defeat the Persian Empire. So without a doubt, Achilles embodies this contradiction in terms of being extraordinary, in terms of strength and speed and skill, but maybe not exemplary, right? Letting other Greeks die and even his best friend dies on his account. But that being said, it doesn't prevent his worship after death. And at his grave site near Troy, and at other sites throughout the Greek world, Achilles is worshipped in the hope that some of his power will be conveyed to, do, to those doing the worshipping. So this idea of being great, gaining glory, and dying young, as opposed to living to a ripe old age, but in a rather boring manner, well, that's just one of the takeaways that we get when we investigate Achilles, tragic hero of the Trojan War.